Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this timely and important webinar on gender imperatives of land reforms in Kenya, which is co-hosted by the European Union, the Government of Kenya, and the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, and the Land Portal Foundation. My name is Husna Mbarak, and I work on land and natural resource issues for FAO Kenya, and I am also the gender focal point. Land reforms in Kenya over the past decade provide for women uh, land rights, yet women have not benefited from these uh, reforms totally. The constitutional provision promoting gender equity and equality have not been implemented. And this is why we are organizing this webin webinar today. Today we will hear from three panelists who are key experts involved in promoting and working towards the gender imperatives of in land in Kenya. Allow me to introduce um, our esteemed panelist, Dr. Fibian Lucalo, who is a gender expert and a researcher, and she has wide experience uh, around the same, especially within land and natural resources. Philip Kilonzo uh, works for Action Aid Kenya, and he has been in the pro, uh, in the forefront in promoting and advocacy, lobbying and advocacy for 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 women land rights in Kenya. Rachel Dinda, who who works for the Ministry of Lands and uh, Physical Planning, as uh, the main um, uh, duty bearer, and she works as a gender focal point in uh, in the ministry. So in the next uh, one hour these three panelists will be asked about the status of gender and land rights in Kenya, their thoughts about bridging the policy and an implementation divide for, uh, for gender and land rights, and the critical aspects of access, use, and ownership of land surrounding gender. We will also uh, discuss the implication of the inclusions of uh, inclusion of gender issues in community land government, governance and who is responsible for advocating for gender land rights. After the hour, we will also open um, the discussion and give room for to all of you to be able to ask uh, any questions and uh, any comments. Uh, please use the question feature to pose questions to the panelists. Um, I'm sure everybody can see that. We will ensure that your questions are addressed in turn uh, during the open discussion uh, that follows. So welcome all of you. Uh, to begin the conversation, uh, Dr. Fibian Lucalo, what is the status of uh, gender and land rights in Kenya? And especially look into the aspects of policy and the implementation or the actualization of those policies. Uh, welcome, Dr. Fibian. Thank you, Husna, and uh, thank you for the question and for this session. I'll begin by saying that Kenya has a relatively young history and the question of gender and land rights re still remains peripheral to the mainstream academic debate. And especially when we look at the prioritization of land management principles. There are uh, many legislations in Kenya that have been enacted to guarantee women's property and inheritance rights, which are included in the constitution of 2010. And this constitution also includes the principles of land management which favor marginalized groups, women and youth. There is also recognition of the importance amongst grassroots organizations working on land, roots, inner land alliance, and policy makers like the Ministry of Lands and other land related agencies. We see today women can buy land through the state, family, and markets. However, around 95% of the land is still titled to man to men, sorry. In general, agrarian transition has been slow and highly gendered. More women are living in rural areas and working on land directly than men. This increased form of feminization of agriculture and issues of uh, food sustainability continue to be a critical question. Lastly, if I turn to the question of improved land rights, we see that notable differences have been created in women's bargaining power in households and communities. Different groups of women are affected differently, for instance, widows, single mothers, and therefore from a research perspective, household data is important, and oftentimes this data is missing. 
gender inequality increases as we move to pastoralist areas, the Asal regions, and the community land. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Fibian. Philip, what are your thoughts on the on the on the same question on status of gender and land rights in Kenya? Uh, th thank you so much, uh, Usna, and uh, I have to thank Dr. Fibian for laying the uh, ground. And uh, of course, uh, in terms of responding to the question on the status, I'll begin by asking myself a simple question: How would women, rural women, respond to that question if it was their chance? And with that, of course, I uh, begin by saying that um, what we are seeing is basically a case of new wine in an old skin. We've got very progressive laws, progressive policies, but the gap is still there, manifesting particularly around implementation. And this, again, scenario is informed by our culture, our patriarchal culture in land administration, where we are seeing not only um, uh, culture being manifested and exhibited by cultural traditional institutions, but also people in land administrative um, agencies also behaving like traditional elders. So the culture itself has actually tied us back and pulled us back in terms of um, uh, really making uh, significant progress. I should say uh, within the status itself, I think there is broader realization that uh, uh, change is imperative and therefore, you can see quite a number of actors working both on the charter to look at what would an ideal change look like, but also working on an implementation framework for realizing uh, this particular change. The multi agency efforts, particularly around this change, is quite notable. And of course, it shows it's a demonstration that much more work has to be done in terms of um, ensuring that uh, the reform that are necessary take place. I think in terms of responding to the status. The litmus test is basically in trying to understand uh, how the government, how the land administrative agencies have been handling the settlement scheme question, how community land has been handled, and how the broader question of uh, evictions and resettlements. Of course, noting that the three elements affect women, and again, is where the road meets the rubber. We really need to look at how those three elements are handled because they are the most critical element that point to uh, the actual status. And again, that speaks to whether women are um, accessing land or not. I think there is still fundamental challenge, particularly around accessibility of services to women, particularly those in rural areas. And more so, not only land-related services, but also justice system on land issues. So there are questions around whether the institutions broadly have embraced the shift that has been envisaged within the policies and laws that we have in the country. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Philip. Now we go to Rachel, and uh, it is very important now you're coming from, uh, we call it every time, the main duty bearer for Kenya. What is your take on the status of uh, gender and land rights in Kenya? Thank you very much, Usna, and indeed our listeners, for this golden opportunity to share on the status of gender and women land rights in Kenya. Uh, much as the, you know, the numbers, uh, data and numbers don't lie. And as Dr. Fibian has said, women own just a negligible amount of land in Kenya right now, uh, standing at probably 5%. Uh, although gains have been made by the passing of the, the Constitution uh, 2010 and the Matrimonial Property Act, uh, the truth is that uh, our, our communities are quite patriarchal. And uh, this has uh, negatively, uh, uh, negatively affect, affected the ownership of land by women. Uh, again, I would also like to talk about the understanding by by women, general understanding uh, surrounding joint registration, more sensitization and knowledge distribution needs to be heightened to, to bring the numbers up. 
uh, essentially we are just looking at ways to upscale the numbers to to go to to close the gap uh, we also know that uh, women generally are more inclined to affection of the family and uh, this uh, leaves them in uh, in a position where they're not able to claim for their rights with with authority although much has been done with the implementation of national land policy the the main principle is uh, about equity and and fairness in land distribution but we still have to to do to do more to ensure that implementation of the policies uh, support women and actually uh, leads to increasing the numbers uh, thank you very much Usna. Uh, Rachel, I have a full-on question uh, uh, for you. Do you think yeah. it will be good, actually, if you look into the, the policy uh, implementation? Could you say something a little bit about, uh, apart from the constitution which you've mentioned and has been mentioned by Dr. Fibian and Philip, probably adding to the other uh, policy frameworks we have around which uh, guide the aspects of realizing the gender balance around our land. Thank you, Usna. Uh, I've talked about the national land policy uh, briefly and uh, the matrimonial property and succession. These are, um, uh, these are gains that have been made generally and the provisions are quite good, but I think uh, there is need for, uh, uh, there's need for follow-up on the implementation and even to, uh, uh, I don't know how to call it, but uh, more needs to be done to ensure that there, there's realignment with the constitution uh, and also to teach women to understand for their implementation. I don't know whether uh, that, that will suffice or you wanted more. I think we can we can bring out uh, those issues. Let me go to the to the f uh, next question, and I will start again with uh, Dr. Fibian Lucalo. Um, and this, these are quite critical issues we want to discuss, and uh, it brings uh, around the broad discussion around access, uh, use, and ownership of land. And I would really need to to hear from all of you, especially the three panelists we have on board. What are the issues surrounding gender, around uh, the aspects of uh, access, use, and ownership? I will uh, start with, again, um, Dr. Fibian Lucalo. Thank you, Husna, for that question. And I think, uh, for me, I look at that question tied to what Philip asked earlier. What would rural women want when we are dealing with the three aspects of access, use, and ownership? And I think in answering that question, it speaks to the heart of this webinar session that we are having. And uh, just to also emphasize something small is that there are three land tenor systems in Kenya, that is private, public, and community. So in answering my answering to the question of access, use, and ownership, I'm mainly restricting myself to the area of private and probably this whole for this particular time. So when we are dealing with access, research has shown that there is a correlation between the risk of poverty, of rural poverty, urban poverty, and land access. Where land access is, does not exist for women, there is the tendency for them to experience or risk more poverty in whichever area they are living in. And also further, that there are many women out of many years of living in poor areas without access to land, they become elderly and they continue to live in poverty without social and social and housing welfare. And these uh, tend to be intergenerational in nature. And women tend to experience more intergenerational poverty when access is denied of them on land. This is because land continues to be in Kenya, the sole basis of livelihood. Land has so much premium that uh, we are talking about not just poverty, but the risk of food insecurity and therefore there is need when we are looking at access in land further to engage in research that examines the, the relationship between access, use, and ownership. And this depends on different counties as we are in a 
devolved system of governance. And uh, when I look at the issue of use, I will specifically narrow down to the use of a home garden. Something basic as a home garden, research studies have proved that cultivation of a home garden leads to improve children's nutrition. It's not just about nutrition, but in some communities we have what we call the traditional medicines, where women are able to plant, given that they have a place they can use for that. And we've seen through studies in Kenya that children attend school and receive medical care and attention when a mother is able to utilize her land optimally. And when we talk about children here, we are saying, I'm saying that there are more girls who are able to attend school. And therefore, lastly, when we think about use is the decision making levels for women. I'm able to make decisions on my land because I am able to demarcate my land and know exactly what is being used. But this is only in the short term. In the long term, these are other questions that come about because normally there is they tend to be more restriction on long-term use of land for women. And I think, uh, lastly, let me make a brief comment on ownership. Women's land ownership in this country is limited, and uh, it often fails to address all the challenges faced by them, particularly rural women, in relation to land governance. We've seen through research done that not everyone can own land in Kenya. There are increases, increased cases of landlessness. And where landlessness is, in certain counties, we see a quite a majority, a, a larger number of those who are landless as being women. And widows, the elderly, tend to really experience a lot of issues and challenges around the question of ownership. And therefore, the um, children, when we talk about intergenerational poverty, we are also talking about in, intergenerational welfare at the issue of ownership. Children tend to look after their elderly parents better if they have that ownership to the land. In other words, ownership to land is tied in a sense to secure land rights. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Fibian Lucello. And I think you've you've brought in a, a good aspects of, of of ownership. And when we talk of ownership in in Kenya, we talk of of registration. I see there is a latest report which. Uh, actually change the the percentage for a long time kenya has been talking of one percent of women on on land but the latest report which uh, a study which was done by kenya land alliance uh, uh really kind of uh, changed the the percentage to two percent and i think it's it's important now we also look into that and you've mentioned it well to say that for 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 increase in productivity we might want to look into uh, um, tenure security which amounts to 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 ownership at one level uh rachel i think uh, i would really need to 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 have your views on these aspects of access use and ownership uh, surrounding uh, gender and land in this country uh, thank you very much, Usna, and, and our listeners. I also want to make a contribution on the issue of, of access, use, and control of land to women. Number one, I like to say that uh, women in Kenya generally may just have some user rights, but they don't have uh, land security. Uh, what I mean here is that uh, uh, women, or well, we definitely know that they're the ones who work uh, in the farms, the rural women. Therefore, as daughters or as, 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 as married women, they are the ones who work on the farm, but they don't have, uh, they, they only have user rights, but they don't own uh, the, the, the land. So I think that's a, a major problem in Kenya. Therefore, we need to work uh, to enable women to access and to control the, the, the land that they are working on because they are entitled and it is their right as the constitution uh, 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 ascribed to it. Number two, uh, women uh, independent of land right is an issue as they have uh, only indirect uh, access through their spouses and their relatives. Uh, and it's so much related to number one, this is an impediment uh, to food security uh, and, uh, and, 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 uh, and therefore, Something needs to be done on the implementation of the of of, of our 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 land uh, administration. 
Philip mentioned in, in, in his uh, opening remarks that uh, land administrators are acting as gatekeepers. <laughs> I just like to, to, to share on a light note that uh, land administrators also come from uh, our communities and they are not exception from the patriarchal systems that have uh, uh, really worked negatively toward uh, our main agenda. Therefore, all of us actually are together in this. And when we're talking about empowerment, uh, it should be from at all levels, not leaving anybody behind, including the, the land administrators. Uh, number three, I also want to say that rural women contribute almost half of the world food security, yet have very, very, very little control over land. This is putting our, our country and indeed the globe in a very, a very uh, dire food food shortage. Therefore, we need all to work to, to, to support women to, to own land. Recently, uh, in Kericho, we, we were happy to, to give some title to six women. This is very, a very small fraction, but these women took a bold step uh, to, to really follow their rights to be able to get their, their land from their father. Uh, with the support of, uh, of Kenya Land Alliance and uh, FIDA and, and, and other civil society, of course, with the, with the support of the government. Uh, I think this should be the trend across the country. And uh, uh, in, 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 in not long time, we should be able to increase the numbers. My next point is that um, uh, I think it's, it, it's repeated the lack of access control and only having some user rights. Uh, the next one is that uh, women face serious underemployment, uh, which is further aggravated by the fact that they don't really own the land. Uh, usually the situation is made uh, more serious when they lose their spouses or, when, or in cases of divorce. Uh, we all also understand that uh, the the our land our land policies sometimes are not very clear on 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 the contribution. For example, when you talk about su su uh, succession, uh, and we, it becomes very complicated even for women to understand uh, the meaning of of contribution and even to apportion and be able to uh, to come with some fair judgments. Another very uh, very important and critical aspect is on the limited justice sector capacities to deliver justice for women uh, land rights. Uh, uh, legal issues are complicated and usually very expensive, particularly for uh, rural women. And this is a big impediment. We, we agree that there's been some, some, some pockets of support from individuals or, or from the civil society or from FIDA and well wishes, but this is not sufficient to, to enable women to have the capacity and get their rights. Thank you very much, Usna. Thank you very much, uh, Rachel. Rachel is bringing out a very important discussion. If you cannot have it, uh, if you cannot have your right uh, automatically, you need to claim it. And that's the, and that's the example he's giving us from Kericho, uh, where, where daughters had to really claim uh, uh, they are right. Thank you, all of you, uh, for those um, for the for the for the for the response to to that question. Now we I would really want us to to look into uh, the discussion around community uh, land governance. Uh, I may say it's a little new dispensation uh, legally or within the legal framework of Kenya because the Constitution of Kenya 2010 has recognized uh, the customary tenure uh, and uh, the aspects of uh, policy are being put in place, but are now we, we want to really in also look into the, the implementation of, of those or the actualization of those, uh, those uh, policies. Uh, again, with a special uh, attention uh, to women. I know from the beginning we are all discussing gender, but I think uh, the panelists have really brought out the aspects of 
where it has been missing and uh, one of the gender which has been missing in the whole discussion is is women uh, probably from um, uh, our panelists uh, and i would like to start uh, with 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 philip uh, to look into the implication of inclusion of uh, gender issues within um, community land governance uh, having that to say that uh, 62 between 62 and 63 uh, percent uh, of um, of uh, the country kenya falls under community land but also in the in the in the understanding that community comes before private and and public philip would you tell us um, the implication of that inclusion of women and considering the aspects of culture and how we do things, but there is a policy call, there is a legal call to it with special attention to women uh, land rights. Th thank you so much, uh, Usna. I think if there is any brilliant piece of uh, law that uh, has been enacted in this country in advancement of women land rights is the Community Land Act. But of course, its intent was uh, anchored in uh, our constitution of Kenya 2010. That's where the intent was anchored. And I can remember myself doing civic education on the constitution and at one point refusing to do civic education on the question of land. And the reason was because uh, men felt fundamentally threatened by the constitution of Kenya because it began to anger equal rights. And so is um, uh, the Community Land Act, which angers equal rights to both men and women in communities. Actually, it dismantles uh, the old order of uh, governance of community land, where again, members of uh, communities were undefined in exclusion of women. They were defined purely as, um, as, as men. And again, when it came to decision making around land governance, it was men in authority, men in position of leadership who really made all those uh, decisions on behalf of the community when it came to natural resources and land. And we've got a number of communities set up in Kenya where that decision is done that way. So the Community Land Act, number one, provides uh, a platform for inclusion, achieving gender parity in terms of ownership of community land. And it uh, sort of takes away the discrimination that used to exist in terms of our access, uh, use, control, and ownership of community land, and invest the ownership of community land to any member of the community who is above 18 years of age, regardless of gender. And that means men and women uh, become part and part, part and parcel of that particular, particular community for purposes of registration for community land ownership. And that is a very strong, strong safeguard, uh, particularly when it comes to um, uh, communities that are virtually discriminated. Indeed, the Community Land Act provides uh, social protection safeguards such that if a member of that community is married out and again the marriage ceases to exist, they've got a recourse uh, in their initial community and they are entitled again to the share of land within the same, same community. So again, that recourse is again uh, very useful uh, in this particular regard. I think more fundamentally for us to see is uh, how this particular law um, breaks the cultural barriers that used to exist that limited uh, women access and the control over community land and resources. And again, more so particularly beginning now to, uh, uh, to, to, to empower women to see them as equal shareholders and also to begin partaking in the share of natural resources on the land and using those natural resources and land itself to increase the agricultural production and use that agricultural production to advance their rights. That is the context of the law. Uh, in terms of structures to implement it, there, is, there has been a lag, and that is where we really feel much more quicker actions needs to be placed if, again, the law is going to confer the benefits that it's meant to deliver. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Philip. Uh, don't run away so fast, because I think we, we, I really needed to get your uh, critical, uh, I mean, thinking or uh, what, what is your um, uh, thinking around access, use, and ownership. I know you've you've discussed uh, the issue of uh, communal uh, community land governance and the aspects of, of women and how the law is yet to really be actualized. But also, can you can you add some little thoughts in terms of uh, 
the aspects of access use and ownership of land? Thank, thank you, Usna. I think in terms of uh, uh, access, use and control, I like approaching it from control because control has some certain direct implications. And uh, we've, of course, been doing uh, assessment of what we call the nine domains of women empowerment, particularly from an agricultural land perspective. And when you do that assessment, then you realize control is uh, an important aspect to deal with it. Land is controlled by men, that's a fact. But we are also seeing, um, even in uh, female-headed households, we are seeing instances of men acting as proxies uh, from outside the union. And again, beginning to control how land is managed within a family. We are also seeing patriarch rearing its head, even in female-headed households. And uh, where, again, you see women in men body, women are more or less behaving and advancing narratives that men would ordinarily advance in terms of access to, to land. And we've also seen cases where women, uh, uh, where, where, where sons have actually taken up the control, the decision making around land from their mothers. And their mothers cannot make that decision, even though the land was left with them. So these are the challenges that we really see when it comes to control. But what is useful is to note that um, the control of land has a direct implication in terms of short term, medium and long term investment uh, strategies and livelihood strategies for women. And again, it defines and determines their level of vulnerability uh, to disasters. So when it comes to vulnerabilities to disaster, it's linked to the investment options that women are able to explore that, are, that is again linked to uh, the land, land use. And, and, and what we've seen um, in most of the cases is that even in a scenario where women are given access to land, are given the right to use uh, a particular piece of land, that access becomes basis of bondage. Uh, they are sort of bonded to their spouses, but beyond being bonded, we've also seen women losing on the gains from their labor, where they are unable to control end production uh, from that piece of land. So at the end of the day, women are being bonded to provide labor to men. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Philip. That was uh, well uh, thought of. And I, I like the thing is when we, we look into it, you look at the aspects of control, which has in so many ways uh, hinder productivity within our within our societies. We're having one gender controlling, the other gender being more of uh, of providing the 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 work or the the manual work or the the, the labor part of of it. Rachel, um, we've discussed a little bit on the community community land uh, governance and how it's new and what is uh, what the law has already and uh, stated. Uh, in terms of inclu inclusions of, uh, of 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 gender, especially in the in the management and the and the governance of that on the on that land, we've already stated also clearly that uh, the aspects of that particular law, uh, Community Land Act, is to bring in the aspects of recognition, protection, and uh, and registration of community lands in Kenya, being now again the main uh, duty bearer. Uh, of uh, land administration and and in 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 management, what what can you say on, on what is happening uh, around the community land governance and the and the and the and the gender imperative, especially consider the consideration of women. Uh, thank you very much, Usna, and indeed our listeners. Uh, community Land Act really guarantees inclusion of all people and um, uh, with a mantra no one should be left behind uh, it is true but this works only for cases where everybody has been uh, in a in a fair uh, level ground but you see in the case of women they've been left behind since time immemorial therefore something has to be done differently to to bring to bring women up to be able to compete fairly with men uh, I think the only way here is affirmative action on, on land governance, deliberately ensuring that uh, women are included in the, in the various uh, land, land management uh, boards in the, in the counties and indeed everywhere, so that they can advocate uh, for their rights, of course, with the support 
of, of, of all willing uh, stakeholders. Uh, therefore, uh, Community Land Act is a big opportunity, I think, uh, for the government to, to, to bridge the gap and, and to, to bring uh, the, the women uh, up, definitely by affirmative action, as, as I've said. Uh, I also want to talk about uh, the, the impl on the on the implementation. I think uh, we right now there is the uh, the amendment of the national land policy that's going on and uh, is with the physical planning already drawn from uh, from na national uh, uh, land commission. And indeed, we welcome all stakeholders uh, to get in touch with us so that we can bring up something uh, that supports uh, the women land rights. And, and that is uh, loud enough and also very implementable. I think these are some of the, uh, the opportunities that we have as a country and as government with our stakeholders to ensure that uh, women uh, come to uh, a, a good playing ground. Uh, we talk about 63% of, uh, of, of, of land in Kenya being community land. Uh, really, I'm not very sure about that. <laughs> Usna, that we need our land adjudicators to, to confirm that and to make that, that, that data very clear. Some of the things that are just uh, hearsay, I think not all of them are validated. You'd realize that maybe the, the data or the figures are so different. I think government has a lot of opportunities, even in in public land, indeed, not only community land, even in public land, uh, to ensure affirmative action to to women. Thank you very much, Rachel. You 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 actually you're making uh, you you're making a call that we are now reviewing our national land policy. That is session of paper number. Uh, five of uh, 2009, which is due for for that review, and I'm glad that uh, the the uh, FAO through the EU funded uh, land governance program has uh, initiated some discussion, both technically and financially, to do that. But also, you're putting out a very important uh, information: the 63, 62 to 63 percent of uh, the alleged 62 to 63 percent of uh, of uh, land under community land might not be true it needs to be confirmed and i think uh, as a main duty bearer you really need to give us that because you've been uh, uh have a, you've been uh, recorded you have records so you need they need to be out there for people to understand what is happening and what land is there available and i might i want to agree with you probably that 62 or 63 percent is not there due to the so many a discussion around uh, and and plannings uh, initiated in various uh, fields uh, which are amounting to use of land. Dr. Fibian uh, Lucello, I will really need to have your view. Now you have you have a lot of experience uh, uh, both at uh, a community level and you have a lot of experience around uh, and expertise uh, around the customary tenure in this country. Can can you respond to that question around the community land governance and the and the women land rights in in in, in general in that uh, focus? Thank you, Rusna. It's it's worth noting that um, where community land is currently laid in Kenya geographically tends to be the area where we have unexploited natural resources and tends to be the area where we can say that insecure land tenure has been experienced the most. And in most of these areas, let me take the example of probably like uh, the Trukana region, where uh, Trukana County, where customary land rights were, customary procedures of land ownership and land use, particularly not ownership, were in place. We find out that there are traditional systems that already accommodate decision making but in those systems, women still are still isolated or marginalized in the decisions. And so even with the enactment of the Community Land right, land Act, from a research perspective, the question is, I hope that this will not be a repetition of what has been happening in terms of the women's, in terms of them being on the table and discussing the issues that are there. 
The other thing is when you look at uh, particularly the discussion we've had before, we are talking about uh, ownership of land. And in Kenya, ownership has been seen through documents. That is title, you know, title deed. There are documents that show that we, we, we are part and parcel of this land. However, when you look at community where there's customary land or large tracts of community land, we see that they are really no title documents. And the key, a good example from what we, where we've looked at in the commission is the Lamu port, you know, the Lamu port, South Sudan and Ethiopia transport corridor project, where the land is being purchased by the, the investors, is that segments of forests and ranches. But there's also the other question of the communities that are living in those areas and the threat of eviction that exists. And we talk about the threat of eviction in areas that are communal, communal land, we are really thinking through the lives of women and how they continue to be marginalized or sidelined. However, there is also an area of, uh, of, of hope in the sense that women have uh, been included in decision-making processes. And we see this through the, st the work that has been done by Groups Kenya in Laikipia, where women are beginning to form their community watch groups and are beginning to be interested in what is going around in the counties and the national government in terms of the debate in and around the whole issue of, um, of community land. However, we know, we, uh, it would be folly of me just to talk about the existence of natural resources without mentioning the impeding threat of climate change. Like currently, we are experiencing, I think, La Nina, you know, drought in Kenya at the same time rains. So, and because women tend to live in these areas, they are either the secondary or primary users of the land within these regions. We now think about what are we going to do ahead so that they are not just on the community land boards, but they are thinking about the impending threat, the impending climate threat that's coming to the management of these particular areas. So um, that's briefly what I would uh, I would think through in terms of community land. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Dr. Fabian Lucello. And I think that's uh, you're bringing out a very important component, looking into the aspects of uh, the natural resources uh, within the within the community uh, community lands, and actually the, even the aspects of uh, large scale land acquisition around around the same. But I have one more follow up uh, question on on the same. Do you think at the rate of uh, the acquisition, especially the the government projects in term the development projects we have, do you think the due process is uh, is being uh, adhered to? Uh, and regards also uh, looking into not only the documented uh, benefits, but also the indirect uh, use by 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 women in those in those uh, lands, putting in, into consideration the aspects of pastoralism. Thank you, Usna. I'll I'll answer that question from by interestingly a wrong thing, but by posing another question. Do we see the evidence of conflict? Has that evidence of conflict increased or decreased in areas of community land since we began, you know, projects that are geared to Vision 2030? And for me, the question is yes, there have been cases where there's been increased conflict on the land because of the various interests on land not being catered for, and in particular, the primary users of those land who are women. And conflict can be, can you know, it, it comes out in different forms because many areas of community land, you see people see vast tracts of empty land, and therefore they claim because it's empty, therefore it belongs to no one. But without giving attention to the different land uses and land practices that are that are done on those particular land when we have uh, communities that are migratory in nature it's a matter of moving from one area to another looking for the pastures so at that particular time it's not necessarily empty land and therefore when government marks out specific areas the intention is noble the intention is to provide services however there are various other aspects of interests and rights on the land that probably need to be looked at much much further than what we are we may be looking at that's that's how i would answer that 
Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dr. Fabian. Probably I'll allow Rachel and and Philip to say a word on the same after you answer this uh, this question. And I think uh, probably most people will want to to run away from this question, but I'm sure we have something to say around around the same. And the question is, who is responsible and holds a duty to advocate for gender and land rights in Kenya? Start with you, Dr. Fibian Lukalo again. Mm, thank you, thank you, Usna. And as I said earlier, much of the work that I look at is from a research perspective. So I see that there are various parameters of women empowerment, and uh, these are complex and multidimensional. Because of this background, it means that there are various government groups that would be responsible. There are various agencies that would be responsible. And there are also various groups of women themselves who would be responsible. For instance, um, Rachel has talked about the whole issue of data, and not just data, but up-to-date data. I believe that research agencies uh, have a right to begin to explore and scratch the surface of what it means for women to access, to use, and to own land, and the relationship between those three aspects. Research agencies, by that I mean like the National Land Commission, the Ministry of Lands, there is KIPRA, there is Kenya National Bureau of Statistics, and, and other agencies. There is also the national government agencies like the Ministry of Lands, which is the custodian really of the data on the use, utilization of land. This should not just be left to the Ministry of Lands alone, because when we talk about rural women, pastoral women, we have ministries like agriculture, ministries like health, transport, education, gender and youth, all those are dealing in directly or directly on aspects to do with land. And therefore, they too have their own store of, um, of data that can be used to influence policy direction. Within that, we also have communities and families and government agencies and various government uh, structures. For instance, as you, you talked about land registration, has there been a movement in land registration and in which parcels of land and how many women have been, have been able to do that? And then lastly, I'll talk about what I call the local traditional authorities, the chiefs or the headmen or the gatekeepers of clans and communities who hold and hold information on certain aspects on this land. And then let me make a brief comment about families. I've done a lot of work around Eldoret and I've seen that there are very many families which, which, which have given land to their daughters, but sometimes the, 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 they want to shy away from presenting this information to the general public because the father will be seen to be weak. So whereas there's been a lot of improvement in terms of ownership of land it is within what i call the silent domain of the family they do not want it let out so that people know that very many have been given daughters have been given land uh, generally that's what i would say thank you thank you very much uh, dr fibian lucello uh, philip uh, now coming f and representing uh, the civil society organizations in kenya what do you think, who should take the, the, the responsibility of advocating for gender land rights in, in Kenya? Uh, th th thanks, Usna. And I think uh, Dr. Fibian has covered quite a useful ground. Of course, civil societies will continue with their role as part of their mandate. But I think within the government agencies, uh, and, and in this particular case, it's about all the ministries that have a stake, including other state agencies, then what we need to see uh, being much more activated is uh, internal advocacy because we've got converts within uh, these institutions and they just need to advance the agenda internally and uh, see spaces that are quite critical. And um, I think from the political class, it's time duty bearers to, took up their responsibility because we elect duty bearers to advance rights, not just to sit and uh, uh, make laws that do not uh, represent us. We would like to see from uh, the parliamentary committees, the Senate committee, and even committees at the county assembly, what kind of uh, progressive measures are they putting in place uh, to advance women land rights. And some of the progressive measures could even entail something like uh, allocation of resources 
towards an adjudication settlement or even making regulations that guide some certain elements uh, within the process or even having strong oversight on some of those processes. Uh, there are human rights um, committees again uh, over uh, these institutions and again they go to play their rightful role. We've got lots of dispossession, lots of displacement of communities where majority are women and again uh, them playing their role uh, will, in essence, uh, mean that they are advancing the realization of women land rights. I don't see any big arm if we can have big people stepping in big shoe, uh, in, in this big responsibility. First ladies, uh, presidents, and, and I think ideally if the president is keen in terms of um, improving the well-being of all the Kenyans, then uh, the women land and gender that um, frees a number of women to access uh, land and also utilize the land to increase their productivity must be an agenda that the president must embrace. So I stop there. Thank you very much, uh, Philip. Uh, Rachel, coming from uh, that background, background eh, of understanding that whenever there is a right, there is a responsibility. Who do you think has the responsibility of uh, making sure we advocate for gender land rights in Kenya? Thank you very much, Usna and our listeners. I think this is a tough question, uh, but the truth of the matter is that uh, government is responsible for her people and uh, therefore is the, is the one that uh, the women uh, demand their rights from, and therefore is the sole uh, high level responsibility when it comes to women land rights. I also want to support what my, my, my colleagues have, have, have talked about research uh, organizations and other agencies and their contribution towards, uh, towards this very important cause. Yeah, but uh, I still, um, I still also support most definitely the support of individual big names, but uh, essentially the whole responsibility and the, persons, the, the person that is responsible is the government of Kenya. Uh, we, uh, I think I'm off. Uh, goal, goal five of the of the SDGs is a standalone gender goal, which the government of Kenya uh, has, has really worked on to bridge the gap on the commitment to discriminate, to remove all forms of discrimination uh, across board, and indeed to get everybody included. We appreciate the, all the work that we are doing with FAO on uh, target five, that is uh, the, the this target that is this uh, uh, FAO is the designated custodian agency which aims to undertake reforms uh, to give uh, women equal rights to economic resources, access to ownership and control over land and property, and indeed to remove all forms of discrimination against women. Uh, it also goes uh, because uh, when women are empowered and uh, own land and are able to make a decision on whatever they do on land, it will definitely uh, remove violence against women or reduce it to some substantial level. And also to remove harmful practices uh, and recognize and unpaid labor, among other things. Uh, therefore, uh, this, this question on who is responsible, in as much as the government is responsible, I think it involves all of us, and it involves uh, a high level of coordinated partnership, which the government must play an important role together with all the agencies to ensure that uh, the women's rights uh, is achieved. Thank you very much, Osna. Thank you very much, uh, Rachel, uh, Philip, and, and Dr. Fibian for, for quite a good uh, and uh, very uh, elaborate discussion around the gender imperatives in, 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 in land reforms in, in, in Kenya. I would will, I will like to 
to just uh, recap as uh, questions are, are coming in before that. I think we've looked into the aspects of uh, where the status are, and I see we have quite a good uh, milestone around policy. The aspects now is to really bring in the implementation and the actualizations of those of those policy. We've discussed access, use, and uh, and on ownership. Looking into access is like oh, it's there, it's very available, and it can be accessed. And looking to to use is being done, but it's being controlled one way or the other. So there's always indirect. Um, used to it ownership and probably that is what the panelists have really spoke about that is where you get the security of making sure you you have it all but in uh, in the country we are still uh, crawling or we are step still step by step uh, in the in the preliminaries of making sure that ownership is at a balance or is uh, is in a good way that uh, brings around the aspects of productivity. Uh, looking into the new dispensation of uh, the community land governance, there's a whole discussion around uh, uh, who will be involved. The law is, as I, I said earlier, the law is, uh, is well stipulated, but the actualization of it is what we want to, to see to see done or to see um, happening uh, in line with the cultural and the traditional setup in this in this country. And again, I insist that even from the discussion which comes out is that community comes first before public and 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 and, and, and private. The aspects of managing of the natural resource and the, the use and the control of it also might uh, bring around the aspects of, of conflict, which uh, one way or the other, and we've mentioned in the discussion, might be happening. And uh, probably from the lack of uh, knowledge of what is happening, but also the aspects of inclusion to, 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 to the discussion. Uh, one important element which is coming out also from this discussion is the aspects of research, being, building into strategies and policies in, uh, in, in, in Kenya. And uh, the panelists have managed, uh, well, uh, well related them, okay. has brought out so, the, the discussion. is I would like to know what women have access to land in Kenya because in Mozambique what we see is that women in uh, access to land is different ways and many of which do not guarantee their pos possession and security in relation to land. Are there programs in Kenya to ensure that land is owned by women? What challenges do women face in the process of land acquisition? I will, I will really request uh, Philip uh, to, to respond to this uh, question. Sorry, Uzna, I missed part of uh, your question. If you can repeat briefly, I'll be glad, but I missed part of it. Uzna? I'm saying uh, Aleya from Mozambique has raised uh, a question on uh, wants, wants to, uh, to learn from what uh, what is happening in Kenya. Is there some la learning they can they can get from Kenya in relation to to the aspects of security of tenure and possession? And uh, I'm sure from the discussion we've stated it, but uh, one of the main questions she's raising: what uh, what challenges do women face in the process of uh, uh, land acquisition in Kenya, which could be a learning for, for Mozambique. Okay, thanks. I, I, I think uh, what is useful and probably what Mozambique might learn from Kenya is uh, about the two TINA regimes that are, of course are explicitly uh, provide an anger for women land rights and that is uh, the private land ownership arrangement and the communal land uh, tenure system because these are two explicit systems that um, uh, vest, uh, or, uh, uh, vest rights women to own land. 
And of course, within uh, the private ownership is that element of honoring, uh, uh, owning land alone, owning with the spouse and uh, owning with others, which again applies to all women. And what is critical is the manner in which the law is implemented. Uh, the manner in terms of um, that institutions that are implementing the, implementing the law, uh, first and foremost, take into account uh, the reality of that particular law that the law provides for ownership under uh, those arrangements. Number two, apart from um, uh, the law providing uh, explicitly for that, is women being aware and conscious about it and organizing in a manner that enables them to pursue the implementation of that law. But what is useful for the two things that I've mentioned to happen is clarity around roles and responsibilities or duty bearers. Like for the case of Kenya, what we've done is uh, to take the Women Land Rights Charter to the next level, which is to generate an implementation framework that is shared by both state agencies, civil society and women movements, and even UN agencies. And out of this particular implementation framework, the way we've been rolling it out is wa uh, through working with all the agencies to ensure that they understand uh, how best to synergize in processes that uh, involve adjudication and uh, allocation of land to uh, community members, because it's through the processes that actually allocate land that women are able to get land. In addition, it's important we also begin to see how uh, the judicial systems are working in advancing those rights, because if the judicial systems are still operating within um, the patriarchal setup, they will also make rulings that are unfavorable to women. So at that level, it's important to bring these institutions to uh, really support the cause. But in terms of um, uh, the challenges that, uh, that, that you see, the first challenge is uh, making the agencies work together. Uh, government agencies, civil agencies, UN agencies, and working with rural women and really understanding that rural women have a stake within it. The second challenge is patriarchy, because patriarchy, as I said at the onset, cuts across. It's not just a box to the cultural leaders. It cuts across the whole fabric of the society, including those holding offices that you expect to um, uh, um, serve rights to women. So again, uh, really dismantling that becomes a very noble challenge. More fundamental than this, the third challenge is again, how this work is coordinated and how it's financed. I think financing has been a huge challenging challenge for the women land, uh, land rights agenda not only in Kenya, but Africa and global. I think we need to have a kind of awakening, a kind of mobilizing to ensure that the, the agenda is well uh, resourced because it has a, a, a spectrum of um, uh, programming areas that have to be dealt with. Thank you. Thank you very much, Philip. And I think I like, uh, I like the idea of uh, bringing out the aspects of coordination uh, of, uh, of uh, the stakeholders around, around the same. And I think that should be a good learning from, uh, from Kenya. Question two, which is from Gladys Warigia. Uh, uh, discussions on government commitment progress to ensure smooth implementation of Community Land Act. I'm sure her question is on where are we? What is the government uh, commitment in the realization of uh, the, the, the Community Land Act? I will pose this question to Rachel being the, 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 the duty bearer. And actually she has a follow on uh, uh, issue in, in regards to the, the regulations of the community land are saying that it's a gazettement was kind of unclear. So now, would you repeat the question? Uh, it's talking about where are we? What is the commitment to all the progress uh, within the Com Community Land Act uh, realization? Uh, the, the, the realization of Community Land Act in Kenya. Where are we at? In a, in a minute, you can respond to that. Okay, thank you very much, Usna. I think uh, there, is, there is good progress, I can say. Uh, but right now, we are, as I, as I mentioned uh, initially, we are, we are at, um, we are at, at review of the policy. And I said that uh, it's, a, it's a long and tedious process, uh, engaging with all communities and getting everybody really to participate, all the, all the government departments, 
uh, uh, and therefore it's 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 going to take a process. It's a it's a long procedure, and indeed everybody is welcome to participate to ensure that uh, uh, what we write down, what we finally pass, is something that we are all agreeable to. But it's really in its initial stages. Just we just got the draft, so yeah. So good. Just to, to add in is, uh, I'm sure the, the government of the Ministry of Lands is in the process of uh, putting up a curriculum and a program for awareness uh, to be able to start actualizing the Community Land Act, but also the counties are preparing their inventories which are due to be handed over and I'm told as per this hour, some counties from the arid and semi-arid areas have handed in their inventory to to the to the ministry. The next question will uh, will like uh, uh, Dr. Fibian Lucalo to respond to it, and is from Justice Wambai. Uh, the conflict experienced in community land areas are they influenced by lack of secure tenure in general for the community or insecure women land rights? Dr. Fibian. Thank you, Krishna. In order sometimes to understand the whole array of the land question in Kenya, we must appreciate that it is the political economy of land that exists in this country and that has been in place since independence. Since independence. And um, we must say that we must say that this has been in place since independence. And we must say that um, when it comes to conflict around community land, it's not just left alone to the investors or the, or the fact that the women have been aware, but the other conflicts that have taken place, probably because of uh, the, the scarce resources, what I call they are already simmering conflicts on the land, inter-clan conflict, probably intergroup conflicts, different types of conflicts, maybe pastoral conflicts, such that when an investor or when, a, when the land is seen to be prime and is being bought by other agencies, it simply exacerbates an existing conflict and therefore the conflict metamorphosis itself now to the, the group and the investor. The group coalesces under a common interest, which is our land vis a -vis them who are the investors. And this tends, even when there is a metamorphosis of those conflicts, into from the local level to the national level, tend to isolate, as it were, women's interest in land. And I think a good example of the metamorphosis of a conflict and an agenda of land is uh, the example of the Chukana County and the whole issue of the oil resources. First, because people moved in to speculate because they knew that the government was going to move into the area and buy the land and then later on, communities are not aware. But when you look at all this, the question that Justice has asked, for me also it raises a pertinent concern, that is the access to information and adequate knowledge about the existing legal frameworks on land. And I'm glad that the Ministry of Lands is coming up now with an advocacy tool on community land, and it's really moving with hand in hand with the counties to ensure that the communities have been empowered. The other thing also that is already in existence and which will come to play is uh, the whole issue of consent. I think many land administrators and, uh, and offices in the county, you cannot transact on land unless the family, the wife, have given consent. So there's already what exists, what can be pushed forward so that it's in this area. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dr. Fibian. I think we also have another question from uh, from Justice Wambai. And uh, Rachel, uh, Justice is asking, we have all agreed that uh, though the government has done ma most of its part on promotion of women access to land, uh, culture possesses, possesses a threat and actually she, the culture word and threat word is put in capital, but culture can be learned and be unlearned. Who will lead the learning and unlearning of culture? Rachel. And indeed, that's what we are working on right now. 
uh, on undoing and unlearning culture. <laughs> As you said, you know, once you learn something, it becomes permanent and it becomes part of you. The process of unlearning is going to be the most difficult, but we have our partners here. FAO, we have Action Aid, we have Kenya Land Alliance, we have FIDA, we have a great team, and we are currently working on, on, on a curriculum to, first of all, to empower women to know what their rights are, and also to beseech the, the communities, the communities to embrace uh, women, uh, land inheritance and land ownership. I just mentioned uh, earlier uh, what is going on across the country about um, uh, encouraging women to to talk to their brothers, to give them their, I mean, what is duly, uh, what is duly theirs. And it is the responsibility of all of us. All of us are in it to unlearn the old cultures and to embrace the uh, the new culture of everybody must be included. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rachel. And the next one I think is more of a comment. And this is how it goes. It's from Selina Kafute Awala. Uh, men should advocate for the inclusion of women in land governance, in land governance, and women land rights are as a way of demonstration of acceptance, acceptance for for change. Uh, this is well noted. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question, uh, uh, Alelia, Alelia has repeated her question several times from uh, Tapoji Moh Mohriji. Okay. From Tapoje Mokhriji, what kind of role does the forest producers play in ensuring livelihood opportunities to the indigenous population? Can I pose this question to uh, Dr. Fibian Lucello? Thank you, Usna, and um, thank you for the, the listener for asking that question. And um, I think when we look at um, the whole issue of the forest producers or the indigenous populations living in forests goes back to various government agencies that are involved in this. On one hand, there's the land. On the other hand, there's the water towers. That's the water tower agency. On the other hand, there is the Kenya wildlife forest. On the other hand, there is also wildlife, which is living in those forests. So it is a it's a multi-agency approach to dealing with the, with the indigenous population living in, in the forest. And um, so far, we do have various cases that have been given by the African court, and we do have various pending matters that are going on in terms of taking the, the communities being given their legal rights to own and live in those spaces of forest. I do know that there is a specific county in Kenya called Nakuru County, which has a task force that is looking on how the indigenous forest people who live on the western side of the Mau forest, how they will be able to access their livelihoods in and out of that forest. So for me, that's the brief comment I'll make. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fibian Lukello. Uh, Philip, there's a question for you from Zembi Odera. You find that in some community setups, there is adherence to the two-third uh, gender rule in their land management structures, but only as a means of ticking of boxes, as the women in these positions don't really have a say in this decision. How can we work to ensure meaningful participation of such women in this position? In a minute. Uh, th th thank you for the question. I think uh, abuse of constitutional provision is not acceptable. And uh, one way to ensure that the abuse does not happen is to is through addressing uh, the power asymmetry. We need to recognize that in all societies we've been having a power differential between men and women. And therefore, programs that we implement must inbuild that and must take into account the disadvantage, disadvantage position that women have held in terms of access to information regarding some certain matters, and therefore have and deliberate efforts to reach women, empower them, and ensure they, that they participate within their spaces with full knowledge and full understanding of what should be done there. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, uh, Philip. The next question is from Margarita Varon. Uh, thank you. Do you have an idea of or a documented approximation to the cost inherent to women uh, claiming for their land rights by cost? I also mean culturally speaking. Probably, uh, Dr. Fibian, you'll be able to work with your vast, uh, uh, to respond to this question with your vast experience in uh, research. Hello, I didn't seem to get part of the question. The question is uh, from Margarita Varon. Do you have an idea or a documented approximation to the cost inherent to women uh, claiming for their land rights? Probably by cost, I also mean culturally speaking. Um, it's, it's Margarita's question is interesting and can be looked at from various perspectives, but I will look at the cost in terms of the hidden or the missed costs of women not being able to inherit their lands. It's been widely documented about uh, schooling, for instance. Many children miss school because of the, the mother not being able to have the inheritance rights to the land. And when I say many children in particular, the daughters do not access school, neither do the sons have a secure livelihood in future. So if you look at that, you're talking about not just one generation of the mother, but also what I keep talking about, the intergeneration transmission of poverty to another generation. Also, when we talk about the, the, the costs, we are really talking about aspects like nutrition to the family, aspects like sleeping, you know, having a good night's sleep, knowing that you'll wake up tomorrow and find your parcel of land. And then lastly, the cost in terms of decision making in the short term and in the long term. Can I be able to make good decisions for the future of my children? That's how I would begin to think about quantifying the, the, the costs or the loss of it all. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fibian. Uh, there is a question from Kola uh, Wole uh, Banu. Uh, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing your name wrongly. <laughs> Uh, the Kenyan experience shows that laws themselves are not enough, but should be complemented by advocacy, campaigning, campaign for attitudinal change, mobilization, mobilization and public interest litigation to enforce the laws. Do you, the panelists, agree? This is because in Nigeria, we are thinking of commencing a campaign. Uh, Rachel, do you want to respond to that? And actually, she's uh, he's asking uh, that, uh, do you agree that should not work? I mean, um, advocacy should not work by itself. And also, she he, they're trying to put up a campaign uh, in, in, in Nigeria. Well, Aole, you are very right about that. Uh, by experience, uh, by the numbers, it is, so glaring uh, evident that uh, not much is happening in terms of increasing the numbers of women owning land. Uh, that means that whatever, uh, the laws are good, they are progressive and our constitution is fantastic. We have all, 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 all the laws that uh, should have made the numbers go, go high. Therefore, I think I agree with you 100% that it needs to be uh, collaborative and, uh, and, and we, it needs to be, um, there needs to be other ways. We probably will follow Nigeria with the campaign. Just draw it and then we we, 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 we will learn from each other. But I think the loss alone uh, is not enough. It has to be complementary by uh, uh, unlearning, of course, the, the, the old cultures and to support, support women to be able to own land. Thank you, Usna. Which means that inclusion, 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 and the coordinated approach is very important. Inclusions of all stakeholder and coordinated approaches should be so as we have people moving towards one uh, goal. There is a comment from uh, WIPK Ott. I would like to translate your presentation to the context of Cameroon. Discriminatory customary practices continue to restrict women access to land in Cameroon. What do you think about the approach to advocate in a first step that the law should make provision of separating three uh, 
stroke uh, crow ownership that land from land ownership and that women at least become legal owner of their crops and trees so what 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 uh, Wipke is talking about is saying that can we have ownership at, at at the different levels so as we look at land with a different owner but the aspects of women having access to grow or to to have uh, to to do agriculture then the ownership of those crops should be at different level what do you think uh, philip I think in my, that is an interesting view, uh, and I think uh, it's a, a view angered on uh, the multiple use of land in terms of thought process. Uh, but I think essentially the most important thing is uh, to ensure uh, some, uh, some significant level of control by women. If again we are saying the land is owned by somebody else, but the tree is owned by somebody else, uh, then that must be quite clear because the tree will not grow in here, it will grow on land. But what is useful within our context in terms of moving the discussion forward is first angering uh, the land rights as basis of production, and then we move from there. When it comes to, of course, um, uh, cultural leaders, and of course the whole policy formulation process, then that country has much more work to do because likely in Kenya we had uh, fairly progressive pieces of law. So they've got to work with patriarchal leaders to change their attitude so that they can actually uh, enact pieces of law that will definitely advance women land rights. The beginning point is beginning to transform the leaders to really embrace progressive policies, progressive laws, that will anger women land rights. Thank you very much, uh, Philip. And actually, uh, w what is being brought out is more of a moral change. The understanding around uh, policy and uh, and and laws is well stipulated. But now we really need to change the attitude. And and I think that is a whole new process which has to be tackled with a lot of. Uh, affirmative actions around it. There is a question from Stella Maris. Um, my name is Stella Maris from Uganda. What is the status quo of fit for purpose land administration for Kenya? I will take this uh, question to to Rachel, having that uh, they're, they're, they're looking into the aspects of administration and, uh, and management of, of, of land. For purpose, um, the, the fit for purpose land administration for Kenya. It's a whole approach uh, to look into the aspects of tenure around uh, what is the, you look into, you know, you, you start from the end results towards the, 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 the how of doing it. So what really fits our main goal, our main purpose around it could be within um, aspects of uh, urban planning could be no aspects of so what what do we really need for us to Thank you very much. I know it's an approach being um, there is an approach being uh, looked into now, and uh, I'm sure the government is trying to really adopt it, and they're still learning on how how uh, to to do it. Uh, let me have um, uh, there's a question actually from Christopher Sowek. What option exists for women to realize sustainable benefits from large scale land acquisition, uh, investments, projects on communal lands? May I request uh, Dr. Fibian to respond to this question? I didn't get part of the question, I'm sorry. Um, 
what option exists for women to realize sustainable benefits from large-scale land acquisition investments projects on communal lands? Okay. I think um, I think that also comes in within the, the framework of uh, Community Land Act, and I think that was uh, it's, it's, it's a question that uh, I think Philip uh, answered it in part by saying that uh, increasingly county governments are uh, aware of uh, what is going on in terms of the investment coming in, the national government is in place, and uh, once the regulations come out to the Ministry of Lands, that is something that women need to be at the center of it all. I think for now, it's something, for me, it's something that we need to, to think through and uh, give it time for, for that particular when the investment comes with the enactment of the regulations, that is something women will benefit from. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Finbian. Now, that is that should be the last question. I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, uh, everybody, especially our panelists, uh, Dr. Fibian Lucalo, Philip Kilonzo, and Rachel uh, Dinda, for their participation and shedding more lights on aspects of gender imperatives uh, in, uh, in, in, in the land reforms agenda in Kenya. Uh, I would like to invite uh, each of the panelists to be able to say a last, uh, in 30 seconds, uh, give a last word to the, to, the, to, to the session. Can I start with um, Philip Kilonzo? I think it's great to have uh, these conversations and we need to nurture them more. So that again, we get to build collective understanding around issues that uh, are relevant to advancing women land rights. And uh, we will continue to provide as action aid um, our insights based on our community interactions uh, in these platforms. Thanks a lot for uh, everyone in, for participating in this particular space. Thank you very much, Philip. Uh, Dr. Fibian Lucalo, uh, our, your last word. Thank you, Isna. The organization I work for, the National Land Commission, has a directorate of research which is committed not just to investigate aspects to do with gender imperatives of land reform, but specifically to begin to explain and, and show to the country the progress that has been made on women and land rights. Thank you to all the listeners and thank you to everyone for the program. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Fibian Lucalo. Uh, Rachel Dinda, your last word? to ease in a bit because if uh, women are empowered, if uh, women own land, they are also easing economically and they will spend less. Thank you very much. Isna. Thank you very much for all of you. And I think one important uh, uh, recommendation we are getting from here, or probably not even a recommendation, but something we need to work on uh, and tirelessly work on is the aspects of inclusion uh, of all stakeholders in, uh, in uh, realizing uh, agenda. Uh, balance uh, within the within the country. Secondly, the aspects of coordinated approaches within um, within all forms of action points taken, and having everything done through all stakeholders. Are, I mean, especially the government being the main duty bearer, and uh, all players, civil society, play a very big role in regards to to advocacy, and they. We normally say they, they complement the, the government's the duty bearers' efforts in be, to be able to have everybody on board into, into the discussion. Uh, the aspects of research came out so strongly, and I'm glad that the National Land Commission has a whole directorate to look into into research in various aspects to inform policies and 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 and, and laws, and actually to give out the real uh, picture of what is happening the ground versus the, the, uh, the, uh, the laws. One important um, 
issue which we, we really need to, to bring out is, the, I mean, which has been brought out is in Kenya, policies are quite beautifully done. Policies have, have actually made a, a big strides in it. But one important part is the actualization of, uh, of, those, of those policy. We have it from the constitution, from the national land policy to the constitution, and also the, the subsidiary laws to be able to actualize the, the, the gender balance in, in, in aspects of access, use, and ownership of land. I would like to thank all of you uh, in the, in the, uh, who participated and also asked question in the in the discussion. We can continue uh, continue discussing. I know Food Agriculture Organization has also been in the forefront to make sure that such such type principles are really implanted in whatever working we are doing and in partnership with the with the host government. This webinar was uh, brought in courtesy of uh, the European Union. Uh, the government of Kenya, the FAO office in Kenya, and the Land Portal of uh, Foundation. We are really thankful and I hope we'll end up, I mean, we'll continue discussions around uh, the same to be able to actualize security of tenure for both men and women in the world. Thank you very much and have a blessed time. Thank you.